Hi, I'm Angela Fair. Every week here on YouTube, I share tips to help you become a more confident watercolor painter and love your watercolor journey. Today we're painting hydrangeas in a loose style in watercolor. This is an overall floral technique that you're going to love with principles that you can apply to paint your own loose florals. Let's get started. We're gonna start with some bright rose here, made by Holbein. And the goal in this painting is looseness, self-expression, getting that feeling of flowers without having to paint every flower. Hopefully that'll also feel like hydrangeas and not just uh, random flowers. So we're gonna start with just some messy big strokes using this lovely quill brush. This is a number six Rosemary and Company uh, pure squi <laughs> pure squirrel. Uh, it's a number series 170. And Rosemary and Company will send you a catalog for free in the mail so that you can compare brushes in actual size. Uh, so take a look at the description of the video for that. So I've just started with the bright rose and you can see already I'm seeing those flowers come to life. Uh, look at how it just, they just spill down the paper. This squirrel brush holds so much water that I can put just puddles of liquid beauty onto my paper with one stroke. And I still haven't gone back into the water yet. And you can see how much is just flowing down the paper in that beautiful transparent way. Good brush will deliver more water to your paper. And in fact, I spend more time removing drips with a natural hairbrush. So we're gonna set that, as, uh, no, we're not gonna set it aside quite yet. We're gonna do a little bit of green here. And I've got a puddle of green in my palette. And all my supplies that I'm using here in this video are linked below. So you can uh, take a look if you just have to have everything I'm using today. You don't have to, feel free to substitute the colors I'm mentioning with similar colors from your own palette. That's a really good way to learn color mixing. And I'm just gonna use this mix of green. It's a little bit of green gold and a little bit of palette dirt and throw some greens down. The pink will bleed into the green as well and give kind of a neutral, kind of muddy, shadow, which I like. And after I've placed those brush strokes, sometimes I can add a little, will add a little water in, let things run. Other times I might rinse my brush and just use that damp brush to pull off and soften that edge. I want to eliminate any white spots, white spaces in the painting that are a distraction from the composition that bring the eye away from the focal point, that movement that I wanna create. While this is starting to dry, we're gonna change our brushes up. Uh, and it's not, we're not gonna walk away because there's more we can do while the paint is moist and shiny. We're gonna try out this biggest uh, number 10 triangular brush from Rosemary and Company. And it's got a shorter body than the dagger stripers I often use. But I don't think that's gonna hurt me here because I do get that interesting shape with the angled bristles. So we're gonna just create some shadow areas using kind of a blue violet, a little bit of cobalt teal, a little bit of bright rose, should give me kind of a gray, grayish violet that should be fun to incorporate into the painting. Right here I've got a lot of water. Anything I put there is going to dissolve really easily. In other areas of the painting we have um, absorbency, the paint, paper is starting to dry and that color will move less. And any new brush tends to have at least one hair that it wants to shed onto the paper. Just lift it off with the point of the brush. I try not to touch my paper with my hands. Uh, if you really can't pick up that stray hair, leave it till after the painting is dry and then you can remove it without leaving a finger mark. Let's try being a little bit bolder. When I'm using, uh, working with brush handling, I like to experiment with both the point of the brush, um, which I get a really nice fine point with this brush, 
and with the side of the brush to see what it does. I use both the point and the side of the brush in my regular painting practice. The point creates the lines and the side fills the area. Let's go in with some pure rose and see what we get. Well, I like that shape right there. That really looks like the hydrangea petal. With, I think, this particular kind of brush, this triangular brush, you're going to get interesting shapes just because uh, if you change the angle you're holding the brush at, it makes a lot of change to the brush with the angle um, changing dramatically. kind of like that idea. Pop some greens in to create some holes between the flowers. And I'm doing it now rather than when I first put the green down on the paper because the pigment has sat, soaked in a bit more and so I have less uh, movement that's going to happen. So uh, just because I was doing some green painting before doesn't mean everything that was green should get painted right away. And around in the center of the flowers, if I'd added that green too soon, it would have bled all over my flowers rather than mostly staying in one place. It's still trickling down that really moist central area uh, and I'm going to let it do that. I'm going to let it think it knows what it's doing and I can work with it. The other thing I want to do right now is see if I can contour a little bit more around my petals on this side. So if it's starting to dry a bit and it's not a lot, I can get a soft edge that still suggests flower shapes. And yeah, I think that's kind of working. I always work to find a balance between what I intend to happen and what the watercolor actually wants to do. That's the part where we say we collaborate with the paint and water because you can't always predict what's going to happen. You get different reactions from the paint uh, depending on what kind of paint it is, what and how wet the paper is, and how wet your brush is. So there's a lot of factors that come into play. And so there needs to be a willingness to adapt your plan if things kind of turn in an unexpected direction. Now I do want to kind of slow down and let the painting uh, kind of mature a bit. We're going to take uh, just a moment to blot the liquid at the bottom of the page. That'll help it dry a little bit faster and it'll also uh, let start to kind of calm down this area which is still the moistest part of the painting, most moist. There we go. And I just use my paper towel to lift a little bit of color, gives me a lovely uh, texture in that area and slows that fluidity. Uh, things will dry a little more evenly. If I'd kept that puddle there, I would have come back to this painting later with a big watermark in that section because it, uh, as it dries and this area is already dry, uh, an edge is created. The mixtures of colors that I've used, the bright rose and then the cobalt teal, are separating in this area. I'm going to get closer so you can see it. And so at this edge here, you can see this little edge of pink that's really beautiful. And I love mixing colors because we get that opportunity for some separation that we can uh, use to enhance the beauty of our painting. It's a feature of watercolor that you don't really get with other mediums. So, so far I've worked with just two brushes, my big round qu uh, squirrel quill. That's pretty much a tongue twister. <laughs> that one was used to fill in the area with large, sure, quick strokes. And then to create some uh, edges, some petals, petal shapes, uh, without having to do a lot of fussing, the triangular brush actually worked really well. Just using it to, uh, tilted at its side rather than using the point to create that uh, petal shape over there. And we're going to do more of that once this first layer has dried. 
Before I turn the camera on, I spent a moment just looking at the reference photo and I squinted at it uh, to see the dark patterns in the painting just a little bit more easily. I want to, as I develop this painting, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, uh, a loose floral can actually eat up a huge amount of time because there's so many things we can find and pull out and I want to keep it simple but I wanted to spend a little bit of time just studying the shapes of the painting itself and studying the pattern of darks and lights so and those shapes in the paint in the photo are found in those darks and lights so I can use negative painting just like I have just now with some perylene green uh, mixed in my palette with some of my green palette dirt the previous greens that I was using and just creating that gives me an edge for my for my flower I'm also going to go back to the green golden cascade green so I actually have three different greens there and using this oval mop from Rosemary and Company I can build up some of those negative shapes um, and really pull them out of the out from the green in the background and when I do that it brings the flowers forward in a very crisp way and you can see that line just um, defines my petals really strongly actually a little more strongly than I like so I'm going to soften I'm right in there I'm just going to use a little water to blur the line between loose and tight between petal and background and by blurring that gives me a little more open-endedness into the painting I also need to soften right there so that I don't have a line where my painting stopped because that's no fun. The other thing you can do is when you have a crisp edge like this and it's really seeming dominant but you don't want to erase it, um, one thing you can do is just go into your flower or into your shape that you've just defined and take some of that original color, some of that pink here, and just add it right in here and moisten that edge. And then some of that pink will flow out into your background and you'll get that softness uh, back without losing your dark green. And I waited a little longer than I should have there, so it's not quite as nice as I'd like. Okay, we're going to just define a few edges of petals using still our bright rose and the cobalt teal that made such a pretty violet. If you want a really bright pure violet, then I would go to a cyan or a azure color but I like the little bit of gray that you get by using the cobalt teal and even just that little line creates the edge of a petal right there I don't want to mess around too much in the center of my flowers because that will give me um, a big dark spot in the center and I think I want to keep that pretty light so we're just going to take our time and try to develop this painting slowly and loosely and I think we often think loose painting and it feels feels like a rush it feels like something we need to do quickly because it looks quick it's splashy it's uh, colorful there's blots of color all over the place that's the pure cobalt teal isn't that beautiful and so it can look really casual, but there's often a lot of forethought that goes into a loose painting. There's holding back, really thinking before you place those brush strokes down. I like to call it painting to your plan. Have an outcome in mind. And as long as you can see that outcome in your mind's eye, you can keep painting. Once you start, stop seeing it, you start to paint a little more aimlessly uh, just to fill the space. You know, you've gone too far and it's time to stop. So let's uh, try to keep that in mind. Uh, I also don't want to make, take a month to develop this demo, so that's a bit of a challenge for me as an artist where sometimes I do take months on a painting as I have to wait for it to tell me its next step. Um, but we're going to just use the triangular brush to create some petal shapes. So I just made a petal shape right here, this lovely curve, C shape. And then I blended it out. 
um, on the edge, feathering it out into the background. Creating a petal edge just with a curved stroke of the brush that gives that hint of more, maybe more distant petals on that side. A little edge up there. There, right there, I see the little knob of color, that little bead that you often get in the center of the flower. So we're going to let that be um, a shadowed part of the painting. Painting around that little knob of color to define it. Yeah, that should work. And again, I found another edge right there. We do get locked into trying to see and paint every flower petal and we want to avoid that. So I look for a petal that's already established up here. I see this petal right there and then I kind of paint that edge to make it pop forward a little bit and then soften out from it. And there I have now a new flower petal. And then I have this petal, it kind of gets defined. And just a suggestion of activity happening around it. Uh, maybe a curve here to continue developing the flower. And a curve here to lead us down into a new flower. These petals of the flowers are almost spade shaped. So when I paint a petal, I can get paint half of that spade shape like I just did here. And that gives me enough information to say this is a flower. This is a petal. Even just a curve at the edge of the spade gives us more information. Does that as well. Can you see the flowers coming to life? Notice that I've really taken my time with this area. I haven't done anything actually. Um, I haven't even taken my time. I've just avoided it. And that's for a purpose. I don't want to start painting flowers in this very soft area unless I can see them. And if I start painting flowers in that very soft area, it's probably going to commit me to painting flowers in the more detailed areas. So I actually want to avoid putting details in the softest areas of the painting. What I might try to do, and I'm doing right now, is just very, very gently hint at some shapes and shadows in that part of the painting. So a little shadowed brush stroke here. We're going to cool off our pinks over on this side a little bit more, a little more cobalt teal in there. And a little shadow in here. A little shadow there. And that makes that flower pop forward suddenly. So I'm willing to be repetitive if it makes my painting better, and it does. That's a hint of a flower center. I think we're going to do a hint of a flower center here too, that little button. A little, a, a tiny mini little curve there. It's like a fingernail clipping of a brand new baby. It's that small and tiny little curve, but it gives us that little hint of a flower. Let's do one in here too. I think that should be, oh my hand's starting to shake. Apparently I'm getting um, into, the, into the danger zone where um, your 
mind starts to fix on detail and it gets really hard to paint loose when you start to feel anxious. So I, that's a sign to me if my hand's shaking or my back's starting to hurt, it's time to take a break. So we're going to wrap this up in a minute. Or at least pause. Just working with a little bit of line right now to again kind of more curved fingernail clippings, bigger ones this time, but those little curved shapes really help make our flower petals come forward. And this is too crisp, soften it. Because and I look at my painting, it's my eye goes right there. I know that's not a good sign. I want to keep that feeling of light in the center and that path of light coming down the painting. Now my instinct as I talk about wanting to finish this painting is to go darker around the edges, really make the flowers pop forward in a more powerful way. But at the same time, I like the softness that's happening here and the little bit of kind of unfinished, the willingness to leave this painting open-ended. So I don't want to go too overboard with creating strong contrasts. Also every line that I paint in a strong contrast is another place where the eye wants to go straight to. It can make my painting feel, uh, it can distract from the rest of my painting. So I don't really want to do that. I want to see the flowers, not the dark shadows that make them pop forward. I'm really enjoying this triangular brush. It's a Series 40 from Rosemary and Company. It creates those beautiful petal shapes with the side of the brush to create those beautiful strokes. Yes, it has a fine point to create lines, but the strength of this brush is really in the marks that it makes when you're using it uh, almost on its side to pull uh, and create those interesting shapes. Just putting a little bit of spatter on my painting using this dagger brush. This is another brush from Rosemary and Company. And spatter is fun to do, but it can really easily take over a painting. So what you want to do is when you're spattering color, you want to use diluted color a lot of the time. And it's going to put down a lighter spray. So that first spatter that I did was almost pure color. And this is a little bit diluted. And the other thing you can do is after, well first, and then tap really gently. That's the other thing you want to look for, tap really gently. Um, you're better off putting too little spatter on than a strong spray and that looks uh, like you've turned the garden hose on it. And then the other thing you can do is really go in afterwards and, and just soften some of that spatter. And I like to blur it a little bit so that there's combination of spatter and softness. And that just helps that spatter from taking over and being the first thing you see. You can also spatter a little bit of water and that can often actually hit those um, bits of spatter you already put on and cause them to blend and bleed just a little bit. Um, I think the cobalt teal would make a nice little spritz of color as well. And again, diluted so it doesn't take over. And then anywhere it does seem just a little bit still too bright, you can blot and lift a little bit. It's the give and take. It's not really your undoing and erasing mistakes. It's just a little bit of come and go. I have some principles to share with you for your own loose floral paintings. You're going to want to apply these in your painting journey and I'll share those in just a moment. Before we do that though, I want to ask you what was most valuable to you about this lesson? Was there a principle that stood out that you want to apply in future paintings? Leave a comment down below. I also love to hear if there's something you'd like to see in one of my Friday night painting club lessons. Uh, let me know and I'll try to add it to my calendar. 
If you, if you like this video, I'd love for you to click the like button and don't forget to subscribe. I share content to help you become a strong, stronger painting here on YouTube almost every week uh, with bonus uh, content and giveaways from time to time as well. Down below the video, I have links to supplies you can use and uh, more content to help you. I have more loose floral painting videos here on YouTube. I'm going to link them in the description below the video so you can have a little loose floral painting marathon to help you develop your own loose floral painting style. Check them out down below. So how does this demonstration help you paint stronger loose floral paintings? I've got a few key points to help you. Number one, think about the overall shape. Looking at my hydrangeas, I didn't look at individual blossoms as much as that overall flow of color through the painting. I build from those major shapes and slowly start to tighten up and simplify into smaller shapes. And that means I get to go from large to small and take my time as I do so. The other thing I want you to think about is value. Convert your photo to black and white if it helps you, uh, which it will. Uh, squint at your reference photo. Look for those patterns of dark and light in the painting. Those contrasts in your photo are what you want to put into your painting to move the eye through the scene and make a strong dynamic arrangement of values and shapes. As you're painting, think about painting from light value to dark value. While you want to have your darkest areas in mind as you paint, and I did position mine here, I didn't go with my darkest, I, I didn't want to lock myself into the painting I, with uh, a strong commitment to immediately putting in those darkest shapes and the smaller shapes. Anytime you start to tighten up, you lose your ability to go backwards. You can always get tighter, but you can't get looser again. And you can always get darker, but it's really hard to get lighter in value again. So this painting I've actually, actually has fewer contrasts or, or more subtle contrasts than I ordinarily would paint in a loose floral. And one of the reasons for that is we just don't have enough time in this video. You, it takes time to build up uh, those strong dark contrasts in a loose painting and still keep that loose feel. I like that I have this beautiful subtlety here and so I'm reluctant to toy with it too much by pushing my dark values. And if I pull this painting out uh, next painting session or in a week or in a month, I can add more dark values if I feel like it needs it. So it's never too late to go darker. Uh, that's why I like to take my time working to build up those dark values slowly. As you paint, think about that overall shape, value contrasts, build from there, work large to small and light to dark, and it's easier to stay in control of your loose painting rather than having your loose painting control you.